Hi, this is John Jackson Miller, Star Wars author. You're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you were looking for. I don't understand why. My superior sends me to these meetings to search for people with a particular vision. History remembers the witches of Dathomir. I was curious to witness a display of your particular skills. The people are afraid. I have my guards. It won't be enough. I understand that you must be frightened, but I'm here to reassure you. You are all under my steadfast protection. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Hello, friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. I am your host, Dan Zare, delighted to talk Star Wars with each and every one of you. Ever since May of 2013, for 11 years now, I wanted to help provide a positive, family-friendly, spoiler-free place to discuss this galaxy far, far away. Imagine walking into your favorite coffee shop and hearing a discussion of Star Wars films, Disney Plus Live action, animation, books, comics, or Star Wars experiences at the Disney theme parks. I want to share that experience here on this podcast, weekly interactive live video, my website, special events, email newsletter, and more. Find out more and join our Star Wars community at coffeewithkenobi.com. Thank you to the official travel partner of Coffee with Kenobi, MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. Check out coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel for a no cost, no obligation quote, and let them know Coffee with Kenobi and Dan Zare sent you. While you're at it, go to coffeewithkenobi.com slash disneywish and find out how you can sign up to join me and members of the Coffee with Kenobi community on the Disney Wish and experience the Star Wars Hyperspace Lounge and so much more. On today's show... Ross Holliban and Corey Club join me to talk about episodes two and three of Tales of the Empire. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. I'm your host, Dan Zare. Today on the show, we're going to talk about the second and third episodes of Star Wars Tales of the Empire. The episodes are The Path of Anger and the path of hate but my two co-hosts have no hanger hanger they're not hangry (laughs) angry they don't hate they're just full of love and knowledge and they are just a lot of fun so i am excited to share the microphone tonight with first the co-creator of coffee with kenobi now we are in our 12th year of the show Corey club Corey, welcome back bud yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Always glad to come back, talk Star Wars, and and keep the coffee brewing. How have I done with the place since you've been? Since it looks you moved great. Out? Uh, it looks great. Yeah. Um, but you can always change things around. You, know, you always have things organized, and so I'm always looking for that that new piece, that centerpiece, if you will, keeping things on their toes, making sure that everything's lightly dusted. So that's yes, good. I like it. Yes. Well, you are the centerpiece. I've got a, a hard frame of you here on just off <laughs> oh, camera. That's, that's just off you camera. Can't quite see it, but it is certainly there. Our other host uh, for today's show, we actually met, which seems so weird to me, at Celebration Chicago, because I feel like, and Corey, you could probably agree, I feel like we've known this guy our entire lives. From the album Cockpit Podcast and Fanta Tracks, Ross Holliban. Ross, welcome back to the show, my friend. Thanks, guys. No no better duo to be on here with than than the founders, (laughs) and congrats on the 11th birthday, and looking forward to everything that's coming forward. Thank you so very much. I, I'm really looking forward to talking about this. Uh, Corey, I know you're a huge Mando fan. Uh, Ross, you are too. You're, you're both um, so loquacious about your love uh, for this franchise. And we're going to talk. We're going to split them up, right? As I said before, yep. it just works out better. I think the path of anger and the path of hate work better kind of as, as, a, as a tandem, really. So we'll just talk about the path of anger first. It's only 15 minutes. Uh, it is the story of how Morgan Elspeth begins working with the Empire and more importantly with Grand. I'm sorry, just he's not Grand yet, just <laughs> Admiral Thrawn. 
Ross, what is one word to describe this episode, the path of anger and overall thoughts? Bridge, because it really is starting to bridge everything into the Jedi, uh, chapter 13 from the Mandalorian. So Mm -hmm. as we started seeing all this come together, I got very excited. Okay. Uh, you're a, you're you're a huge Thrawn guy, aren't you? Do you love Thrawn? Oh yeah, yeah. No, we That's have. Right. And then we got the guy sitting right back there behind That's me. That's right. There he is. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's got to make you feel at ease. Look yeah. out your shoulder. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Corey, uh, what about you? Uh one word in letter or not letter, sorry. One word in overall thoughts on the episode. Yeah, my one word, I don't even know if it's a word. You tell me English teacher, uh shadowy. Um, I guess it's kind of a, a word, yeah. But it is. Uh, I went with that because it it just it felt um, very um, I don't know mysterious and not I don't want to say dark and as in a bad way, but it's more of like um, there's like a there's a growing presence, right? Um, and it's interesting to see these it's almost like factions, if you will, kind of be, being built up. And like you said, Ross, like it's this is kind of the the bookends, if you will, of of you know, what we saw in Mando and now we're seeing in this kind of this origin story of uh, Morgan. Uh, and so it was interesting to see. Um, and it's, I got a little confused and I'll, we'll talk more about that, about how I got confused, but uh, it definitely, it definitely feels Felonia esque and he, he does great details like always and gives us a great story. I very good. Very good. I, I would describe this one as heavy. This one feels like you're, you know, when you walk outside, uh, if you're in a certain part of the world and it's really humid and you feel Uh like you're kind of walking into something just kind of hits you and you, Uh you can't really see it, but you feel it. This one feels heavy. It's very dark. Uh, The coloration by Joel Aaron and the lighting is really marvelous because when Thrawn's on screen Mm -hmm. and he's of course got blue skin and dark hair. And it's it's dark outside. It's like almost like a midnight texture. It's hard to kind of make those colors pop, but it just kind of gives you this feel of oppression. And and she's Morgan Elspeth is just a very depressing person to spend any time with, <laughs> anyway. So I, I feel like dark is a good way to describe this one. Uh, actually, before we like, I just want to talk about things that pop in the episode. But Corey, uh, because of your uh, profession as a designer. Uh, designer of the coffee with Kenobi logo, of course, friends. Yep. Uh, when you when you see Thrawn pop up, and like, talk about the kind of coloration here in, in uh, sort of the atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, it, we get kind of two reveals. Uh, we get the the admiral uh, that like shows up to, and this is where I got confused. I couldn't remember who that was, um, but he kind of was testing her, right? He, he's 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 oh, Pelion. Superior Pelion. Pelion. Yeah. I thought he was uh, Azel, um, uh, Azel? Admiral Azel. Mm-hmm. So I got Fair. those confused. I had to do a little internet research, but um, yeah. So that guy kind of reveals himself as say we're testing you, and then we, we see Thrawn's reveal, and she moves out of frame, and there's Thrawn, right? He's it's almost like he's been there all along. So it's like he's always been hovering in her presence. He's wearing a, I think a black uniform of sorts. Yeah. So yeah. it's really shows that he is not necessarily stepping out of the shadows yet. He's staying in the shadows. Um, he, he wants not to be known yet. He even says that through his dialogue in the sense of like, hey, I kind of got my own thing going on. Uh, those chips up there are mine. Uh, you have full control over those now. I'm going to basically give you some of my power. Just a, just a, just a taste uh, because I, I want you on my side. I see your, I see your power. I see you're raising for the ranks. I, you have, we have a similar... Uh, cadence and so yeah that way that reveal is really interesting to me um because they could have had him wear a lot of things but he's still the kind of the military mindset and so mm-hmm. he's almost still at attention uh as well so he's still looking in the shadows um and that that coloration is just interesting because his blue skin is just it's kind of like sh- shock you don't necessarily see a lot of that color um you know coming off of some of the characters around throughout the whole episode. And so it's, 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 he's definitely in a limelight and we know him now to be a huge centerpiece in the star Wars uh, franchise. So when he does come on screen, it's definitely a presence. I really like that idea that you just mentioned about uh, he's wearing all dark. Cause he's sort of still in the shadows. That's really astute, really oh, excellent you. stuff. 
Yes, Ross, what is it? So for my feelings on Thrawn, I liked him better before he came into Rebels because I just like the kind of the, the specter of him from Heir to the Empire. Um, mm -hmm. And this has nothing to do with canon versus non-canon. I just, I, I just liked him better when Timothy Zahn was writing him uh, for whatever reason. Actually, I think I know the reason. I kind of feel the same way about Thrawn. I do Venom or Bane and Batman. I feel like they're so powerful for my for my heroes that they just make me uncomfortable. Like so uncomfortable, I feel like my heroes are not going to win. And that makes me feel on edge. And that takes away from the escape and it makes me feel actual anxiety for my fictional heroes, which I know is just <laughs> so silly. But I think that's also the power of why he stands out. What is it about Thrawn that you like so much? Well, for one, it's not silly especially with the audience that will be listening to this we all feel it and we're on the edge of our seat yep. during certain episodes and that's why some of us wake up at 5 5 30 in the morning to, to watch before <laughs> going to work because we have to see it and it really it drives that adrenaline and excitement and allows us to take part in this awesome community sharing those chills together of just like oh my god this was unbelievable can you believe it um but Thrawn, and especially through the books and, and Timothy Zahn going into how cerebral he is. Uh, he, you know, he's fit. He, he knows how to fight, but that is a last resort for him. Uh, he's typically two, if not three steps ahead of everyone else. And it's, it's that whole, he's playing check. He's playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers. Yep. And that's the beauty of him. It is that mysteriousness. It is um, what he's bringing in. Everyone never really knowing what's driving you. And the, the books help to share that with everything in his home world. But different things drive him and no one can quite pin him down. That's interesting. Yeah, he. Uh, no one can quite pin him down. I think that's... I think that's part of what uh, frustrates uh, Moff Gideon and the Shadow Council when Thrawn disappears, because they, they, for all they know, this is part of Thrawn just pulling tricks. Yeah. yeah. But but let's talk about this episode specifically. Last week was the Path of Fear, and I think it was all about Morgan Elspeth's fear and, and how we are supposed to fear to feel. And this, the anger thing, is so prevalent because we see why. Or not why she's angry. We know why she's angry. We see what she wants to do with her anger to embolden herself and in her mind to get revenge. Corey, let's start with you. What are some things that stand out about this episode that you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, I kind of have a notes here. This is kind of her next chapter of her her upbringing. You know, we see this, this like I said, the previous episode, her being that fear, that young person uh, that's uh, unsure what to do. Um, and she, we see her kind of come to grips to that and use that fear as her weapon. And now she's at a stage where she's trying to get more power on her side and work her, work her revenge story. We get that, that piece of the, the puzzle there for her. And it's funny because I recognize the, it's on Corvus. I thought it was cool. I was like, Oh, it's that entering that gate uh, that's mm -hmm. comes from Mando season two. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, Hey, this is where we first saw the li first live of action. Ahsoka. I mean, we we're all kind of gearing up for that. Like, and then the way that they mirror that, like it really put me back on that seat uh, anticipation level. I was like, okay, there's there's depth here. Like she wasn't just like hanging out on this planet to begin with. She has a reason to be here. Um, she's got definitely, um, you know, plans on plans. And I actually I was interesting that she failed uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the beginning briefing there. Um, and I was interested that like, it's the empire is more complicated than you think. You can't just say, Oh, I'll get them to work for me because I'm just really smart at this. I'll throw some stuff their way and they'll, you know, come in line with me and I'll get my next step. And she failed at that. I thought it was a really interesting play into her character that she's going to have to work a little harder uh, to make her revenge story come true. Um, but yet we see throughout the episode that that's different. So um, really interesting that uh, these characters, and I kind of, I don't know. I guess I felt like she, I kind of felt empathy from her a little bit in this episode um, because she failed. And the fact that like, Oh, I, I do know that back of my head, I, she wants to take this revenge and 
um, it's going to be difficult for her to take this road. And why am I cheering for a villain? Like, <laughs> it's interesting. You know, and it's, but I think that's the writing and that's the, the way that it's built into this story uh, and framed up. So I did a good job of that characterization of her. So you found, so you found this to facilitate a feeling of, of empathy for her. Yeah. I mean, I, because from the coming off the previous episode, I mean, she's she's purely motivated out of fear, and she uses that then, like I said, kind of weaponizing that and realizing I need to take revenge. And that's like how often have we felt uh, powerless or fearful of things? And it's purely out of love for her mother. Like she has tragedy in her past. There's some tragedy built. That we think of the superheroes like Peter Parker uh, and Bruce Wayne having tragic past. They could have gone. A, a completely different path of becoming the hero. And she, is she becoming a hero in her own way? And we just see it as a villain of, you know, coming off season two of Mandalorian. I, you know, we see her as a villain and, and whatnot, but her, maybe her reasons for doing this is are heroic. Hmm. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't center her. If you're dividing a line between villains and yeah. heroes, I would put her on the villainous side, obviously, but yeah. like, you know, but there, she's kind of that gray area. So, um, that's sure. That's Interesting. All right. Uh, I think we're going to follow up on that. Ross, uh, what's what's some things uh, that jump out to you about this episode that you'd like to talk about? I mean, I, I think I'll build there first with Corey and sure. talking about Morgan. So she's already had the the clan mountain people and that failed. She she watched the Night Sisters be destroyed, if not wiped off out of the out of the universe but then she's again got people and she has failed them and they she she talks about it they've turned on me so quickly and then she realizes these will never be my people so one of the key tenets of star wars is found family and she fails at every turn of found family mm mm-hmm. So I think that is setting up as a perfect enemy and a perfect protagonist or antagonist to be across all of this. So you're really digging in and and finding to Corey's point, what is turning her heart just to utter blackness and not caring about anyone. And you see it from each episode kind of expanding And then what I did immediately after watching the path of hate again today was watch the Jedi, the chapter 13 of the Mandalorian, because I was like, and I'll, I'll get into some of those details a little bit later, but it tied perfectly into who she is and how Filoni and everyone else involved in this tied it all together is beautiful, but Mm -hmm. also love seeing Rook fighting. So him getting introduced and that that came that was uh, to take uh words from greg mclaughlin that was not on my bingo card at all to see <laughs> rook show up in this so it was awesome to see that fight um but then also getting kind of the the start of the tie defender you know mm-hmm. this thing that thrawn really like that's the driver in rebels for him is to make this thing happen yep and seeing that morgan was the one that actually started it is incredible that was fun. This was like a very much a greatest hits of Thrawn, you know, with, with the Tide Defender, with with Rook, with with uh, Pelion, and then just him showing up before he gets the title of Moff that the Emperor bestows on him. I, I I guess I wanted to talk about my challenge with this episode and really all of the episodes with Morgan Elsbeth is I don't find her to be sympathetic. Hmm. I well, that's not true. Empathetic, sympathetic, yes, empathetic. Definitely not. Uh, she's sympathetic because you feel pain because she watches people that she loves, her family, her people get destroyed. But then, uh, and I talked about this a lot last week too, But so I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but she has a choice with a, a loving community that wants to take her in from her same planet. She refuses it. What she does is she sows hate and discord and anger because that's what she knows. That's what she's comfortable with. You know, people do what works for them. What works for Morgan Elspeth is to be angry and to hate and to and to eventually do come to a place where she tortures people and she becomes the evil that she despises. She becomes the evil that she hates when she tortures the people of Corvus. 
right? And she holds them hostage and, 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 you know, it's indentured servitude and they have to work for her and they don't get breaks and they're treated terribly and tortured. Um, you mentioned the Jedi. I've seen that episode so many times because I show it in mythology class all the time. And this is, this is a woman that has lost her way as far as you, you have to stop and say, well, has she lost her way or is this just who she is? I mean, you know, I don't. I don't know that she's like the Joker. Some people want to watch the role burn because that's not it. She has a motive. No. She has purpose. She has intent. And then Thrawn, it's like she's like an angry child. And then Thrawn gives her the keys to a nuclear warhead. Yeah. Right. And there she has no. She's disciplined with her martial arts, but she's mm-hmm. not disciplined with how she deals with and processes her grief. And that slippery slope becomes like uh, just a water slide down into hell for her and, it, and it's hard to watch i have a hard time spending time with morgan elsbeth and, and enjoying her character because she is just she's one of the more depressing characters in the star wars universe and it, it's all by design it's all brilliantly done it just she sucks a lot of energy out of me because she's so sad <laughs> i wrote down here uh she wants to preserve her culture and they, really, they touched on it a little bit i think in that conversation with thrawn and like you said, the, the uh, her, I guess her her clan or whoever were all wiped out, and mm-hmm. so she's the last, as far as she knows, the last living piece of that of that culture, and right. she wants to reclaim that. Mountain people didn't really have that for her. And then to Ross, your point, I wrote down these are not uh, her people. When she says that, uh, you know, as they haven't gone through the crowd, she kind of like rebukes them, and they're kind of you know jeering her on and. And so she's looking for that found family. And even though she can't find it, she wants to preserve her culture her own way to your point, Dan, do I think, I guess that, I don't know. I guess I feel for her. I guess that empathy is, is different. Yeah. There's more sympathy for her because she mm-hmm. is a lost person um, looking for, to find her way in her own methods. Um, so yeah, definitely it's, it's, difficult to watch you mentioned rook and I, it was cool to see that i was i did not have that on my bingo card of all either and i had to look him up again because there's so many different characters that come and go and flown does a great job juggling these these different characters throughout the series and bringing them up where you don't least expect it and i think that's that's the the genius of him uh he just will do that and i think this was this episode was a really nice beat uh of like you know uh going from the the interview or the uh the debriefing uh, all the way to the end. And it's like, there's a lot of like, there's some action going on. There's like a lot of good beats. So, uh, you know, just the way it flowed was really smooth and really palpable and I could really digest it. Well, that's so cool. Uh, the um, one thing I want to point out real quick before we go back to you, Cord, bring up your next point is I think it's cool that um, Moff is Dane who is the the imperial the smug imperial fat cat that, that Cassian Andor would probably really dislike? And he says, you know, we're actually not interested. We're just wasting your time. We're going to steal your resources and steal your ideas. And ha ha ha, we're so we're so mean uh, and arrogant. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're more as Thrawn says, they're more motivated by the bottom dollar, which will ultimately make the army more weak. I like that. Is Dane, if you juxta, if you switch around the, if you put the D in the front, it becomes disdain. Like he just sort of is an embodiment of disdainment. And I think that's pretty cool. I'd be shocked if that was an accident. So mm. kind of, kind of a fun little clever wordplay. I mean, he did, this is the guy, like Dave Floyd didn't write this, this is a man of Munoz, right? He's the executive producer, but it is his story. But this is also the guy that created a Jedi whose name is I'm a gonna die because he's only in one episode of Clone Wars. So <laughs> it wouldn't shock me if that was yeah. the case. Corey, what's your next point that you'd like to bring up? Uh, the other thing I had was just like little, you know, glimmers of things. The witches of Dathomir. Uh, obviously we see that come back around in, uh, in Ahsoka, a season one. Uh, the, just, there's just the twinklings of, of the threads that we're pulling here. Uh, you bring up, Oh, this quote rebellion. And it's just like, so interesting to see like how smug and how mm. confident, uh, Thrawn is. And even this, this early years of like, Oh yeah, I've got this all figured out. And he's even like, even brings the context of like, yeah, this, whatever this empire long, like almost, he said long of the empire. And he also says at the end of uh, Ahsoka as well. And I was like, what, what an interesting perspective that 
he is still kind of like mocking. Uh, I, I guess we're gonna say like uh, mocking his 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 power set, like the people that, who to give him his power. And if they were to ever find out, which they you know would never would, but like they would just strip him of everything. And but he's so like I said, three steps ahead of everybody that um, he's just going to you know, do what he's going to need to do. Obviously we see in rebels uh, that he uh, gets foiled and I, but does it get foiled? I always think about this sometimes too. I was like, was this his bigger plan? So it's like, it's so like, it's a mind game a little bit uh, for me, I think through that, but that line of long live the empire was a great ending for his exit. Uh, And really cool to see him do that uh, at the end of Ahsoka as well. Agreed. Yeah. Good, good connection. Ross, Quinlan Ross. (laughs) I think it's really uh, the villagers and how they're brought into it where that can absolutely be standalone, but how well the animators did and how well written, even just those, the villagers were, especially with wing, you know, who becomes governor wing eventually looking like his character. Yeah. Seeing how, he he was so minor and he he's the beat down character throughout all of it until we're watching him in the Mandalorian. But it is watching him devolve. You know, he's he's rendered almost powerless by Morgan, mm-hmm. but she keeps him around and she keeps keeping him around. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I know that this person can talk to the other villagers. That's his value to me. Mm-hmm. But no one else she doesn't appear to have any concern for anyone else. I don't know if it's a soft spot for him or if it's just, Oh, he's a tool that I need in my toolbox to keep control of everyone. But I thought factoring in that small component, but putting the details into it just made it that much stronger for me. And he like enables and empowers her. He believes in her, but she's not someone who screams. I need someone to to hold me and hug me and, and right. empower me. And now he, she just wants, he has, he can answer the keys of the, mo- the biggest army, the biggest military might in the galaxy. But the thing that strikes me, and I've watched her conversation with Thrawn several times, because I think it's the best part about this, mm-hmm. is she wants to destroy her enemies. Well, who are her enemies at this point? They were the droids who ironically, she's almost, she's not working for them because that was a separatist, but the separatists uh, and the clones combined become the empire. So in a way she's sort of working uh, for the person who destroyed her people because Palpatine has orchestrated everything. He orchestrated the clone wars. He orchestrated this. She has no idea of that. Um, Thrawn probably suspects, uh, but maybe he doesn't. I don't know. It's just really interesting because to me, she doesn't have any more enemies. She is her enemy, but Mm -hmm. I don't get the sense that she hates herself. She just feels like someone who has no direction. And I think I would argue even with Mando and what happens in Ahsoka, she wants to be with her people, which doesn't happen until she finds Thrawn and goes, you know, to another place in the universe within a separate galaxy. But at this point, she is a woman without direction. She's going to have weapons, but nobody really to fight. And the people of Corvus are not her enemies but she uses them in the way that she is. She is a victim. Like this is a classic psychological, like if I was a counselor, like if my wife was talking to I'm sure she could talk to about this, a greater understanding than I could ever imagine. But trauma is such that if, if you don't take care of the baggage that you have, you know, hurt people, hurt people, right? Hurt yep. people, hurt people. And that is what we see. And again, that's why it's, it's hard for me, but I want to get to the next episode. So let's give this one a letter grade. Uh, Corey, let's start with you. You know, I always tend to do this. I lower or I, I hide my grade just from the conversation. Um, it was at a B plus. I'm going to give it an A uh, just because I think it's just there's more layers to this than I realize um, even talking through it myself. So it's an A for me. Okay. Just a solid A, not A minus. A. A. Okay. A. Yep. Excellent. Ross? And I'll go with Corey's original with the B plus. I, I thought it was fantastic, but... Um, you know, they're, they're just pieces and I, I want to watch it another time as well. So I've watched it twice now. I like kind of digging in a little bit more before I go all the way up to an A, but 
it it was solid and it was so fun to watch on May the 4th and just kind of rip through all of those, not knowing really, I, I didn't look into what was coming or anything. So I was just like, I turned it on and I was just like, oh, fantastic. Um, so I'll give it that B plus. And this is another example of why you don't watch the trailers because the Thrawn <laughs> reveal would have been really cool, right? If he just showed up, I'm going to give this one a, a, a very generous B minus. I, I, I appreciate um, that this is a story where we get to see that the, t- the ties and how they kind of come into play and to see the impetus of her working with Thrawn was nice because we don't have that when we watch the Jedi. Yep. Uh, so that was cool. But ultimately, you know, it's, I mean, it's, there's, they're just tales. They're not supposed to be massive mythological lore builders uh, for the ages. Uh, but it, it did its job. It was beautifully lit. Um, uh, very compelling with the idea. I still don't think Morgan Elizabeth is very interesting. Uh, and so that's why it's a B minus. But speaking of that, let, let's, let's go ahead and jump into the next one. Uh, so that was the path of anger. This one is the path of hate. And we see hate in full display here. Uh, we'll just keep it in the same order. Corey, one word and overall thoughts on the path of hate. Yeah, the one word I had was layered. Um, just because uh, they did a good job of just juxtaposing the like span of time. At first, I was like, oh, this is a direct like uh, time right after this the previous episode. And, like, I didn't realize... Oh, no, there's t- some time has changed. The animation is a little bit different. The village is a little bit different. There's there's guards in each tower now. I was like, oh, this feels different. Like there's there's more of a presence here. Um, what what changed? And then we realize this is a number of years uh, into the future. Um, I, I really did like that they didn't like obviously tell us right. We had to learn that through the dialogue and some of the mm-hmm. characterization. And things, and so uh, Wing is a big player here. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, um, yeah, I think he brings a lot to the to this episode. And and, and now that I think about it, probably the previous episode, just he's us as the audience, right? He's kind of trying to understand what's going on. Uh, and, and he even says, like, "Oh, I made a I made a horrible mistake by putting her in charge." And uh, it's just there's a weight there too for him uh, and those villagers. And so. Um, yeah, and then to see the I forgot her name the 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 villager come back to work as a as a uh, Nadura Nadura Nadura. Thank you uh, for uh, working for the New Republic. What a great way to just just tell us what's going on without telling us what's going on. I don't want to say that. You know what I mean? It's like telling mm. without telling me, but you did. It's such great. Like this was a previous villager, uh, this, and she's coming back to, you know, bring them to, into the fold. And then she, a tragedy happens for her, but uh, it, man, it just, it's, it's so interesting that they centered on this planet. And I, I kind of took into the fact that like, you know, when like, news hits and like, you don't see it for a couple more days. And you're like, Oh, I heard so-and-so passed away or a tragedy probably happened over here. Like, Oh, I didn't know about, you know, Oh, so-and-so, you know, it's just like, that does happen. Those things are true today as we, even though we have instant technology that can tell us all the answers of what we want to know, but we still are trying to catch up. Um, and we don't get a lot of, um, tales around these, kind of these, these backwater planets or these lower planets that would be impacted by the larger goings on on the, in the galaxy, almost said universe, but in the galaxy. And it's interesting because if I think about Thrawn, he is definitely in his quote own galaxy doing his own thing. And so it's like so far removed that we have no, we wouldn't have any clue obviously since we've seen Ahsoka, but like, man, what, what an interesting perspective to have and knowing that the Empire and the Rebellion are so focused on what is going on right in front of their face, they're missing the outer uh, story or the outer threat that's coming to light. So um, this definitely kind of hit it home for me, and it was interesting because at the end of this, I I thought there was going to be a fourth episode of like go, go continuing this on, and I was like, oh, no, what is what happens next? And I was like, oh, we already know what happens next. So uh, – it was silly of me to think that, but uh, it was fun for my realization. All right. Uh, Ross, um, one word to describe the episode and overall thoughts. 
So the the word I used for episode two was bridge. So this kind of ties in a little bit with that. The word for the path of hate is burning. Um, she is yep. slashing relationships. She is, you know, it, it's literal and figurative as we reach the end of the episode. And it, as that was happening and as, as the ground is being raised and the trees are being lit up, that's where I was just like, oh, I really need to go watch this episode of Mando again and see what relative components were there. And that is all those burned trees are 100% there. And I was just like, wow, that is just brilliant how that was all put together. And then how Ahsoka used it to her own advantage during, during her part of the episode. Um, But yeah, the, the burning there, there's a burning inside her and she's, she's talking about her visions now Mm -hmm. and you, she's blind to anyone else like she is she is solitudinal just waiting for her opportunity and maybe it's another attempt at found family with Thrawn Mm. I don't know if she knows anyone else that he's dealing with currently on the other side or outside the galaxy (laughs) but there's just there's so much going on but all of it is her burning any chance of having any found family which we see metaphorically both in the first episode and the third with the, the fire yeah. uh, motif. But she's well, and that, that, that started her on the path. Mm-hmm. But now and now she oh, has yeah. taken it up. Oh, I agree. Word. I like that. My my word for this is stunted. Mm. Uh her growth uh is completely stunted. It is completely stopped. There is no growth. This is just um Hayden. And uh, I guess it's fair for me to say uh, that I I totally believe why the first episode was created because you see her we know um in Ahsoka and in the Mandalorian that her, she lost her people we know uh how her people were eradicated eliminated by Grievous and the Separatists the Clone Wars changed her for the for the worse right the second one was about how she becomes reunited with Thrawn. And how that relationship with the Empire starts. And that's a nice thing to fill into. Hmm. This episode to me is not a story that was screaming to be told. I, as much as I, I, there are some things I like about it, which I will certainly talk about. I love Diana Diana Santos. She's fabulous. She's great. She's a great person, great performer, great actor. But this one it just didn't work for me. No, I think you're fine. I had these questions kind of towards the end, but I'll, I guess I'll bring it up now because I had that same question written down, Dan. I said, do we believe as fans that we need these filler stories? Because that's, I mean, not to connect the dots and go those aha moments, but like, do we need to have those uh, pieces along the way um, to fill the gaps? Is Dave just kind of fleshing out all his ideas? What do you guys think? I mean, like, it, it's it, is it worth um, a 15-minute animated episode to learn more about these characters. I don't think any of these are fillers, but I know what you mean. Sure. I don't think they're fillers at all. I think uh, the fact that they are told in a shorter uh, sure. Sample amount size. is appropriate. Right. Yep. Uh, but the first two, you could probably have expanded them and, in richly. So, and Amanda and David talents behind this would have made it, would have made it sing. Sure. Um, it's just that this specific episode, uh, I didn't, I didn't learn anything about Morgan Elizabeth. She's mean to the people. Uh, she fights against uh, the New Republic. I already knew that. That didn't fill in any gaps. Sure. Um, uh, so, that, but I will say, just as a preview for the next two weeks, I will not be seeing anything remotely in this universe for episodes four, five, and six because those are stories that do need to be told and boy, are they told well, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Well, and I think, I think there are opportunities. This is more of a slow burn episode Mm -hmm. to me. And it was, how do we bridge this to the Mandalorian episode? And I think that's the primary purpose that this served, but I think it also goes to show as we look at, things in recent history of dictators taking over places and just becoming so vile that more people turn against them. 
-hmm. it does build. And, and we do see this and we see it going from the path of anger to the path of hate and into Mando, because I don't believe on this, we have the, the kind of little individual torture. No, we don't. uh, Right. Whatever they are. Do hickeys. Yeah. (laughs) For each individual. So this is showing she has power without influence. Hmm. So when you're in that role and you're She's waiting for your other things, yeah. you start losing your mind. Mm-hmm. And I think this is showing that path and how that can happen because she's really just going off the deep end where people, they're like, Oh, we don't even see her anymore. Good luck yeah. being able to see her. So she's a recluse. Mm-hmm. And when you're sitting back there and you've only surrounded yourself with yes, people, and droids, assassin droids, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. You're going off the deep end a little bit more. So mm-hmm. I think it really is a slow burn setup to, to show who this individual is and how she got there. You know, knowing that she came from a tragic background, but she she let that fear and that hate and that anger turn her into this. So you don't have to be a Sith or a Jedi to understand those things. It's, it's kind of the human element there. And we know that the path to evil is paved with good intentions, right? Typically people don't intend to be evil. Um, There are sadly, there are pretty concrete cases that that is the case, but for the most part um, it's, it's not the matter. It's the manner and, and the things that you do and the choices you make slowly get you to a place where you can't pull yourself out of this tailspin of, of the mm-hmm. fate that you've chosen for yourself. But what, what is it? What are some parts we would like to talk about? Cause I do, I have some things I can, I mean, I'm not going to be, there are plenty <laughs> of things I can talk about that I think do shine some lights on some very positive things uh, that, that are in this episode that I'm looking forward to talk about. But Corey, let's start with you. What are some overall, like not overall, but just key things that jump out. Yeah. I kind of want to branch off what Ross had said about, uh, just, well, I guess you guys both said like just her Morgan's growth. She you just kind of you're right. She does kind of stop growing as a person, and she just kind of comes stale. And and we, I, I was thinking through the the ideal of uh, what she was at the end of Ahsoka, and she really just becomes a puppet for for Thrawn, right? So I, I so she doesn't even accomplish what her goal uh, necessarily, right? She doesn't really get her people back, and you know, get her culture back. And I mean, she meets some people who are. Uh, of, of akin to her out of suppose, you know, she feels enabled. She's kind of, I think she gets kind of like a baptism. I can't remember a, a fire of such. So there's your fire term again. Um, but that maybe fulfills her in a new way. She maybe she's not necessarily worried about her, her culture anymore. She just wants to rise to some kind of a power. She's maybe, maybe Thrawn's leaking his, you know, uh, uh, his, his own ambitions into her to some degree. So at this point, Thrawn's gone, right? Thrawn is exactly. Yeah. He's, he's point. off doing his deal. Uh, uh-huh. and I think it's like, cause if I remember correctly on the Ahsoka episode or the, the Mando episode, uh, the question was like, where's Admiral Thrawn? And it's like, That's kind of it. ends there. And so it's mm-hmm. like, okay, now there's more questions, but we get to see all that. So it's just kind of like rounding uh, that circle off. You're drawing a circle all the way around. You're coming back around to center. Like, okay, we've, we've drawn a, a circle around this. Like, She's there's nothing else to play out for her. She's really an empty character, um, mm-hmm. to some respect. So, for her end, I don't think there's much to be said, uh, other than you know that. Um, the, the hopefulness of you, you saying about the, the villagers, I, I really did like the way that, um, the characters were dressed, and I, I was still trying to pinpoint the time frame of like, uh, like they had the blue caps and the white, like this garments. is new Republic. So this is after, um, this is set during the world of, I would guess it's probably Lord right before the Mandalorian meets Grogu. It would yeah, be my guess, they, didn't they my go and take guess. over that, that ship and Mando season one, that, uh, uh, new there, there's, a, the there's a prison guard, ship. Like a, yeah. There's a prison the, ship. Yeah. These are all new Republic guards. Yeah. yeah. So I, that's where I connected the dots there. I was like, but they're, and then the darkness they start with, all those dark droids up on top, and then the, the light comes down in. You're like, okay, who's this going to be? And it ends up being these characters are full 
white and blue. Uh, they're bringing a hopeful message to these these downtrodden people. You can kind of see like they're kind of like, oh, what's going on? Oh, oh, it's oh, it's somebody we recognize from the village. And I was like, oh, okay, this is kind of a cool setup. And that goes tragically wrong. But I also thought it did well when they they do attack her um, and make her run off, and she's trying to escape. I was like, man, she knows where to go exactly, but she's been here before. She's she in episode two. Yeah, yeah, which is so pretty cool. She doesn't talk in this episode, cool. but she's there. Sorry, I didn't yeah, mean to so, cut you off. No, you're fine. I just thought it was really smart writing uh, of way to way to put this together. And really, we don't leave this little compound or this little village uh, at all. We're, it's all told right here, and mm-hmm. that's all they need. So I thought that was really nice, too, just to see that um, – that's just a centered piece. And this is where it's going to stay until you pick it back up uh, with Mando. And so, um, yeah, I think that's interesting. I'd be curious to know more of what your thoughts are around that, that hopeful message. Ross, where would you like to take this? Uh, Want to jump off that or do you have uh, something else you'd like to talk about from the episode? Yeah, I, th- I think I can build there. And I, I think it goes into even what we learned some in bloodline by Claudia gray oh. is the arrogance of the new Republic and how they just expect everyone to, to get on board. Like, Hey, we're the good guys and we won, but, and here's taking it someplace completely new with, with Hamilton, you know, when, yeah. the, when the King is just like, Hey, winning the war is the easy part. It's governing people afterwards. Mm-hmm. It's the difficult component. And I'm sure those were the exact lyrics from the, from the play, but um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I felt like Lin Manuel was on the show. I was very excited. <laughs> it's the costume, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, but just that arrogance of her coming in and saying, "Oh, if I say this, it'll happen." And mm-hmm. as soon as he said, "Yeah," the uh, Corey, you talked about this earlier. Oh, the news doesn't get out here that fast. That should have been moment number one of you know what we're going to turn around and come back when we have a little <laughs> bit of a plan for this instead. Because it is just going in and being st- know your audience, whether mm. you're designing, whether you're putting together a presentation, whether you're attempting to free Caladan, know your audience. And <laughs> Nadura did not and paid for it. Mm. And so much of this, uh, because because now it's like this is all hate. She, she just says she's they Nadura says some, I don't remember what the exact wording is uh, like turn yourself over something like that. And she says, are you prepared? I hope you're prepared to back up that statement. Yep. Right. There's one moment in this when Nadura is talking to her and we hear a splash on the side and she looks to the right the fish. and there's this large, large fish, you know, uh still fish scale kind of doing this little splash of the water. The, the pond, we've seen this uh, before. It's where she and Ahsoka fight. And, you know, fish and water is is really symbolic for a lot of reasons. Um, and, but and I haven't quite fully fleshed this out, so I'm just going to kind of babble until something makes sense. But <laughs> when you, you know, that there, I think there are two possibilities here. One is she suddenly is looking down at this fish splashing because she's not interested in the conversation. She doesn't care about what this woman is saying. She thinks it's a joke. She wants to stay in her little prison. Like you said, she's, a, she's an isolationist, which is a great word. Mm-hmm. And she just going to be surrounded by yes, men and droids. Like you had mentioned to uh, Corey and Ross. And so that's just like a quick little distraction um, because she just doesn't care that Morgan Elspeth is gone. Like she's just a shell of a person now. And you even see it like with her cold affect, the way she talks. And I think it's cool the way Diana plays that. There's one that's, I think that's probably the most obvious one, but then I think on a, on a, on a more symbolic level, you know, water again, is growth and change and it's very clean and serene and beautiful, but there's nothing going on. Uh, The fish are breaking the waves up a little bit, but it's just really quick and subtle there's nothing going on. There isn't any change. There isn't any growth. There's no transformation or metamorphosis. It's just business as usual. You know, fish are the lowest form of, uh, on the, on the kingdom, you know, the fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, fish are the lowest level of intelligence because they just purely 
reactionary and instinctual. And I think she's almost like that fish now. She's so ingrained into her hate that she's completely, uh, she's just, she's not an instrument of action. She is completely a person of reaction, which is why she is not a main character. And that again, like I really want you to be wanting really clear on this. That's not bad. It's not bad storytelling. This is a short. This is like 10 or 11 yeah. minutes of actual animation. The rest is credits and introduction, yeah. right? She is not a main character. She's not supposed to be a main character. She wasn't created to be a main character so far in her story as, sure. as of the time of this recording of this podcast. So it makes sense that nothing would necessarily happen. We already knew she was evil and nasty. And now she's declared open war on the new Republic, which is not a great idea, but they're so fractured in a, in a sense that they're kind of split up so many places. You know, that Hamilton quote was a great one uh, because it does sort of much typify that, but she is not capable of change or growth uh, any more than that fish is capable of escaping that little pond that it's in. It's stuck. It doesn't know any better because it's just there. And she is that fish. Hmm. Well, and it's the big fish in the little pond as well. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. just being blatant about that. Right. Yeah. So there you go. Thanks for helping me. You kind of walk through that. I've Good. got my thesis ready. <laughs> That's right. Uh, anything no, else you guys want to talk about with this? I mean, I really, I, I'm going, I keep thinking about your word you used, Ross, about burning. And I have the quote written down here. Don't let any, everything burn, burn down around you. And that's what uh, Nodura said uh, kind of her or to her as that she's not trying to negotiate. And she said something else that struck me was, oh, I'll help, let them go easy on your sentence or, or, or something like that. I was like, she has compassion for her. So she almost, like we said earlier, like she kind of sees her spiraling out of control or you know, down and, and this poor previous citizen, like she'd been almost like delusioned, like, Oh, the new products. Awesome. And I'm a total buy-in fan. Like I, I will help you. I will even go soft on you. Like we'll, we'll bring you in. It's okay. You know, but we're going to try you for crimes type thing. But like, it's just like, it, it, I don't know. It's interesting to see that perspective of you could drink the kool-aid for sure and like mm-hmm. and feel like it's really good and like hey i'm gonna go back to my home village and do this this do good good deed and and that's a just i think a really bad unfortunate case and um it's just interesting to see that uh because you don't see a lot of that in animation just still like these these innocent characters um getting getting hurt and but that's the again i think we talked about this in the previous episode of, of just like that oppression factor um and that's just what those villagers are feeling and it has it's still going on in these outer realms and even the it's almost like it'll take millennia to figure out these outer realms of what's really going on or you mm-hmm. know that that's where the worst the worst is these, these lower systems that are being just go fly by night type thing we don't know what's going on and and it's kind of a sad thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's like, sad. oh, we finally got out to you. Uh, we'll, we'll make it there when we make it there. And so it's it's really kind of sad in that sense of of how that 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 works. But um, it makes sense. I mean, like you said, Ross, it, it's, it's very much a mirror of our current, mm-hmm. you know, world. It is. It is. Uh, every time, just as, uh, every time you say something about the village people, I keep expecting you to sing one MC. <laughs> Yeah. And you, you haven't. Ross has already done Lynn Manuel, so I don't know what you're waiting for. Okay. Uh Ross, anything you want to add before we give our letter grade? <laughs> I I love the distress call that goes out at the end. Oh, it's in. And the fact that it's Bo answering. You know, who's who's the one that tells Mando to go there to find Ahsoka? So mm-hmm. again, just that little thing. Like you got three words basically from her, but it's just like, Oh, all of this perfectly sets up for what's happening next in live action from this place. So again, those beautiful elements of weaving together, just great storytelling. So I I appreciate that so much. Um, And it was exciting to that. I'll tell everyone, and I'm sure most people have watched it numerous times. Go watch Chapter two, Mandalorian, or chapter 13, 13. season two of the Mandalorian, the Jedi. 
watch this episode prior to going into it and you'll just be blown away. I think if you haven't already done that of the continuity and watching Morgan Elspeth turn into what she's turning into. See, and I, I would flip that a little bit and say, watch this first and then the Jedi because the Jedi is told better. Uh, <laughs> so I, th- I think that would be a better book isn't, for you. Isn't that always the case? I have one more question on here. It's kind of like for the group. And I said, what are your guys thoughts on telling one main story, which is kind of like kind of the film or the TV series. And then having to go back to use books and comics and animation to fill in those gaps. Like, We've got this so much as Star Wars fans throughout the years of being Star Wars fans. Uh, we had, you know, obviously the, the main movies and had the books that came out in the 90s and such and kind of kept us fed and the prequels came out and they're telling a backstory now. We're going to tell whatever happened. And it's always been like kind of the the MO for Star Wars. And we don't see this a lot of other uh, franchises. Do you guys like that type of storytelling? Does it work for you? Are you just gotten used to it? I'm just curious. Uh I will probably talk for an hour, so I'm going to say, Ross, why don't you go first? <laughs> I, to, to keep my answer short, I love it. I love going back, and uh, and some people will call it retcon, I think. But I think it's just additional detail. So sure. it's anything you go back into. It, you have this massive world building that has been done, and you only get so much time in a film to tell the story. So sometimes the jumps have to happen. Sometimes getting that additional information to me, I love it. It's, it's almost like doing research the most fun way possible of going through and be like, Oh, that ties into the, Oh, that's why this caused this. I love that. I love those aha moments, but especially when they make sense. And I think Filoni and who he has around him are going out of their way to make sure that it makes sense and it's feasible. And all it does every time something else kind of a new puzzle piece gets created and and merged into it, it gets me that much more exciting, excited for what's coming. I, I like that answer a lot. I will say that I like it. I like (laughs) it, but uh, it has to be a story that is worth telling. A story, like the word retcon is about how I feel about the word filler. I find both of those to be academically lazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like those terms because I think there's more to it, right? If you want a good example of what it should look like, let me introduce you to my friends, episodes one, two, and three. What do those do? They fill in some gaps that you didn't know that you needed but they flesh out and make episodes four or five and six better because right. Her calling Boca tan and getting a distress call does not add for me anything to the overall strength of the original story. It doesn't have to, again, this is just a small 10 minute thing. That's not bad. It's not pejorative. It's not negative, but to me, if you're going to jump back and forth and fill in story beats, then I don't want it to be for trivia. I want it to be for strength of narrative. Yes. For yep. for overall enhancement of mythology that broadens our scope and deepens our profound understanding and love and respect of these characters, not yep. for Easter eggs. Does that yes. make sense? It does. Uh, Book of Boa Fett. Sorry, I said that out loud. Um, no, 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 nothing there. Yeah, go for it. But um, I think you're right. When you're telling a story that's, a worthwhile story. I'm not just picking on Star Wars. I'm picking, you know, Marvel's uh, no uh, done their sort of yes. things. Uh, DC as well. I mean, like you have to keep things rolling, keep things moving. And I think that Filoni and team have, does their best to take compassion on each and every character, even if it is Morgan Ellsworth, right? Like, so it's like, well, let's just see what else she's got going on. And I guarantee <laughs> Filoni had this all mapped out already. He's just telling the rest of the story, like you said. He's he. These are the cutting room floor stories that he didn't get to put in. So uh, more power to him and his team uh, for getting those in the fans eyes. So, Oh, that. I agree. And I hope these tales of uh, animated uh, mini uh, minisodes last until the end of time. I love them. I was going to say, too, I remember They're the fun. books in the nineties that were like the tales of the uh-huh. empire, like those little shorts, the exact what those are. Basically yeah. those were small little stories of yeah. side characters and fill, fill in the blanks. So yes, Absolutely. I was thinking of that too. Glad you brought yep. that up. So let's wrap this up. 
Uh, Corey, letter grade and, and uh, last minute thoughts. Yeah, I, this wasn't as strong as an episode as the previous one. Um, I'm going to B minus. And uh, it does make me want to go back and watch uh, Mandalorian and, and even Ahsoka. And like, oh, yeah, okay, this all wraps together. And and I, I do feel a little bit fearful of like, okay, what other, what other things are going to come out that we are going to n- not know until later on down the roads, what's under wraps still. So it is cool to see some of these characters pop back up again in the zeitgeist of, of Star Wars and keep the, uh, you know, these I think they do a good job of keeping these characters who they truly are Thrawn, of course, uh, and keeping him, uh, in that space. And then just the overall, just storytelling altogether has been fantastic. I think that, it, and the animation, everything, all the, all the teams working on this stuff, they're the top tier groups doing this. And I mean, I'm, I will say, even though I have, um, you know, minor, uh, pit nitpicks, I think we're still getting good, great helpings of star Wars. Yes, and always. I will always sit at the table and hold my plate out <laughs> with a big baby bird expression. More, please. <laughs> Ross, Corey, we're you? above, at least on my screen. So if you want to like dangle a gummy worm or something like that, oh. that'd be perfect right now. You know what? Yes. It's so funny. I happen to have gummy worms right here. So uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> candy. There you go. Awesome. Feast. Awesome. Feast. Um, I'm going to go with a B because it made me think i don't think it was an incredible episode but it made me think and it made it touch so many other parts of the galaxy and what's about to come up that that to me does so much and you know the fact that i watched that and as i'm watching i'm just like oh now i have to immediately start this live action show <laughs> that that to me that's what a show should do. It should make you want to watch the next thing and to get something else going. So again, slow burn, but it was a, it was a strong burn and something that leads into more. So I always appreciate that push into the next level. Absolutely. I like that. That's, that's really cool. And the fact that it got you excited to revisit the Jedi is fabulous. It was fabulous. I'm going to give this one a, uh, I'm kind of waffling between a C and a C minus. Uh, I'm going to give it a C minus. Uh, again, again, nothing, nothing structurally wrong with it. It was told uh, the this the way it was told, and it, it was told well by talented people. And I, and I want to also emphasize that look, um, far be it for me uh, to tell someone what's good and what isn't. I only know what is good and what isn't for me, for my sure. personal taste, for my palate. And that's one of the things that Corey and I started from the beginning, you know, no spoilers, family friendly, positive, and it's okay to disagree, but not to be disagreeable. It's okay not to like everything. And I, and I will never, I think you should never uh, besmirch someone for the love of a narrative or for a love of art. Cause if that piece of art is a wellspring of life giving for you if it brings you joy then you should celebrate it and no one can tell you otherwise and i and i hope that that makes sense because for me it was not that for me but that's okay because episodes four five and six my cup is runneth over (laughs) in that regard listening to coffee with kenobi you are with dan z the podcast you're looking for this is So my cup is also runneth over sharing the mic with you two. How lucky am I? Honestly, how lucky am I to talk to Corey Club and Ross Holliban about Star Wars or anything? It's such a joy, such a delight, Ross. Thank you, as always, for coming back on the show. It's always is great to chat with you. Uh, what is going on in the world of Ross Holliban? Uh, Butler University had an amazing commencement weekend this past weekend. So... My life kind of gets back on track a little bit more. Um, I have restarted Rise of the Red Blade, which uh, is very exciting, especially seeing what Morgan went through through these episodes. So I'm wondering how much that has impacted how I look at her and someone's true nature 
in what's calling to them as well. So that's their um, couple new album cockpit podcast episodes have, have happened um, with a couple more on the horizon. So those can start happening a little bit easier now. And then I'm going to take the opportunity here as well. Um, after doing finishing the bad batch and the reviews on Fanta tracks for all of those amazing episodes that occurred. My first professional boss uh, is retiring from the Baltimore Ravens after 41 years. So in the next couple weeks, I will be heading back East for his retirement party. So wow. John Dubé, thank you so much. Uh, still one of my best friends ever. Um, and you know, the experiences that we shared and the opportunities that he provided me, um, are just immeasurable. So from a found family perspective, thank you so much. That is lovely. That is, so yes, absolutely. Congratulations to him. And, uh, Thank you again, Ross, for being on. And Corey, come on, buddy. <laughs> uh, we started the show together 11 years ago. Right. Um, I'm just eternally grateful for you and, and your friendship. And um, yes, collaborating with you, but just also just uh, being able to call you family and call you friends. So thank you for being back sure. on. It's like riding a bike, isn't it? It is. It's always, always fun to come on and talk Star Wars or, hey, check us out on Pour Over where we talk about more than just Star Wars. That's always a good time. Uh, D&D, X-Men, Marvel, DC, whatever floats your boat, we're on there. And we got a lot of content to chew up and spit out at you. Um, so we're happy to do that. And it's always exciting to talk fun things of that nature. And, and we're not going to slow down anytime soon. Huge thanks to Corey and Ross for joining me to talk about the second and third episodes of Tales of the Empire. And that's one of the best parts about the Star Wars community and what Coffee with Kenobi is all a part of, and that is you having a voice. And there are so many ways for you to share your thoughts and opinions on this episode or other things Star Wars related. First, the official travel partner of Coffee with Kenobi is MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. If you right now go to coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel, you can get a no cost, no obligation quote to anywhere involving Disney vacations or honestly any kind of vacation you are interested in exploring and finding more about. They will do the homework for you. They will find the best prices. They will look for the best hotels, the most convenient routes for you. It really is a complete game changer in the world of travel. And not only is it going to make your vacation better and easier, but you will support me and Coffee with Kenobi as well. And here's a really exciting aspect of this, as you've probably heard on CWK Live and at the top of the show, you are invited to join me on the Disney Wish Cruise. This is an amazing experience. We're going to go June 16th to the 20th, 2025, so it gives you plenty of time to plan and get ready. Find out more at coffeewithkenobi.com slash Disney Wish. I am so excited about this. We went last year on the Halcyon, the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser. And several of our friends from that cruise are joining us, as well as so many more. This is your chance to travel with Star Wars friends and make new friends along the way. Again, find out more at coffeewithkenobi.com slash DisneyWish. As I just mentioned, if you want your voice heard, a great way to do that is CWK Live. They are on 7 o'clock this week on Monday. Go to coffeewithkenobi.com slash live. It is a place to share your top five moments and this week, we're going to give your top five moments from episodes two and three of Tales of the Empire. So you'll be fresh and ready to go. If you want to share them online, you can go to our Facebook group, which is coffeewithkenobi.com slash community. And that is where you will find the CWK Cafe, a place for Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler, and drama-free place. Huge shout out right here to members of the CWK Alliance. Thank you to all of you because of you. This show is possible because of the members of the CWK Alliance. Thanks to you, this podcast, CWK Live, event coverage, and so much more comes to life. Find out how you can help this show for as little as $1 a month by joining the CWK Alliance, and you receive access to CWK Prover, an exclusive weekly audio and video podcast not heard anywhere else. Members at the CWK Alliance All-Star Level receive a video edition of CWK Prover and access to a private Facebook group as well. Find out more and join the CWK Alliance at coffeewithkenobi.com slash CWK Alliance. And 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to St. Jude Children's Hospital. 
You can email me at danzy at coffeewithkenobi.com. Connect with me on Twitter, Instagram, and threads, and as well at LinkedIn. Coffee with Kenobi is all over social media like X, Instagram, threads, Pinterest, TikTok. Give this show a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffee with Kenobi. You can also subscribe to Coffee with Kenobi's YouTube channel. Where you can find over 700 videos, past live shows and events, and this podcast. Please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you like the logo, go to coffeewithkenobi.com slash shop and get your Coffee with Kenobi t-shirt, hoodie, laptop sticker, and a lot of really cool things, including phone covers. Finally, if you need a speaker for an upcoming event, you can book me to come to your school, conference, business, or organization. I am happy to talk with your group about how to tap into your strengths, bring out your very best, discuss mythology, or customize your presentation to fit your specific needs. Thank you, as always, for joining me for a virtual cup of coffee. I appreciate your time and very much look forward to the next opportunity to talk Star Wars with you. I am Dan Zare reminding you that this is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along.